Father in heaven, we thank you for your time that you have set apart for us to come together and worship you and speak of you and study your word. And we ask that you would be with each of us. Father, we ask that you cleanse our hearts and minds, that your spirit can move amongst us. And Father, we claim the promise of Yeshua that you would lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. As we fellowship today, Father, we ask that you do this for us because we recognize our great need. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. I want to go back to Daniel chapter 7. You know, every time I do this, I do it a little bit differently and bring in different angles and answer different questions that people have. And we get feedback, and the feedback really helps me to know uh, whether, whether what I'm saying is registering. And what I'm finding is it is registering, but we always need a different angle on something. Because if you look at something just like a diamond, you look at it from a different angle, you see a different color, or uh, the beauty comes out a little bit better. And God's word is like that as well, especially the prophecies as we look at the prophecies. So I want to do something which we're all familiar with. Daniel chapter 2. And I'm looking, I'm going to be looking for help, okay? So I want to take this down for now because I made my point. And I'm going to get this out of the way. We're going to come back to that board in a while. Okay. So Daniel... Daniel chapter 2. I want some help here. Daniel chapter 2. Somebody that's quite familiar or fairly familiar. We don't need all the details. But I want somebody to lay out Daniel chapter 2 for me, if you will. And, you know, don't be shy. Uh, we just want the main, kind of the main points here. Pardon me? A statue. Da uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel didn't have the dream. This is a very interesting fact about this prophecy. This was not Daniel's dream. The interpretation was given to Daniel, but it was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a little bit of history in that he liked to believe that he was um, almighty, you might say, and that uh, his kingdom would go on forever. And this dream was a revelation for him uh, that his kingdom wouldn't actually last forever. So somebody give me some details on this. So Daniel saw a statue. And what did the statue have on it? Can somebody give me some details on the statue? All right. Head of gold, Babylon. Okay. And then the chest and arms of silver, or shoulders. Okay. Uh, the belly and thighs of brass. And then the legs of iron. And then the feet and toes, the iron and the clay mixed. Okay, that's good. So tell me what all this means. You're not finished yet, Tara. Well, we know that the head of gold is Babylon. Okay, how do we know that? Uh, because it says, it it tells us in... Daniel 2.32. Yeah, Daniel 2. It tells them that, yeah, that the head of gold... 
thou art the head of gold. Uh, yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. so he tells Nebuchadnezzar that he is the head of gold. So there, that's a pretty good starting place, right? Would you agree? So does it say somewhere in there uh, an indication of what follows the head of gold? How do we, what's the wording in there that we know? Um, and this is, this is what we need to do. And I'm making this point for a reason. What saith the scriptures? That's what we need to know, is what does actually the Bible say? And so this is what we want to nail down, because as we move forward in the prophecies, what I'm finding is people are not going back to the prophecy to actually check to make sure what they're saying the prophecy says actually says that. And um, this is where we find the inconsistencies when we want to move forward, we want to take the ball further down the field. We got to go back to the playbook, if you will, and make sure we're running the route that we're supposed to run. So what does it say here? Yes, um, Judy says verse 38. Somebody read, read that. And whenever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are the set of gold. Okay. So, no question... Uh, Daniel is referring to Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. So someone, uh, you want to pick up verse 39 again, Chuck? But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. In the, oh, do you want to go to 40? Yeah, go ahead. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Okay, one more. And as much as you saw, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this? The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Okay. So who would like to take uh, this opportunity to tell us, just give us an abbreviated version, two, two sentences of what we just read there? Who would like to do that? Don't feel you're putting yourself on the spot, because you're not. I'm putting them on the spot. No, I'm not. Okay. Somebody want to try that? If not, I will. Um, well, there's other kingdoms that are going to come, but ultimately they'll all be destroyed by the kingdom of God. Okay. That's, that's good. That's, that's a good abbreviated. So if we go back to verse 39, it says, But after you, that's the head of gold, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. 
Okay, here's my point. Here's my point. Babylon ruled over how much of the earth? They were the number one superpower at that time in the world. So in a sense, they were ruling over the earth in, in that sense. Then came Medo-Persia. They basically took over the Babylonian Empire, but it actually expanded it. So they were, they were that second kingdom. And it says, after you. And then, and then the third one, it says, which shall rule over all the earth. So my point being here is, we're being shown here successive kingdoms that have come and gone. So we could say here, the head of gold would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, and then the third one would be Greece, the Grecian Empire. And then what came after the Grecian Empire? Rome, right? Rome, and then Rome turned into Papal Rome. When Papal Rome ruled, this became the Dark Ages. That should be a, a little lesson for us when church gets complete control of state. It gets dark. And then that empire uh, kind of broke up, and it was divided into the, uh, the different kingdoms. And it says here that this kingdom, in the days of that kingdom, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. Is everyone here okay with that interpretation? And, and I'm not asking any kind of a, everyone thinks that I've got some sort of motive behind the question, and I generally do. But um, the obvious explanation of this prophecy starts with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the breaking up of the Roman Empire. There is discussion about exactly how many kingdoms uh, we ended up with here. But we know that the uh, typical foot has ten toes, and that's what um, we're looking at here. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So this is what we're, we're looking at. So the thing is, there's, there's a little tiny problem here. This is an attempt, all these are attempts to rule the world. The, the papacy actually with the Roman Empire and then turned into the papacy, they, they were trying to rule the world as well. And then, it, and then it, that fell apart and broke up. There has been attempts. Um, the most recent attempt probably has been uh, uh, the attempt by um, Kaiser Wilhelm. Uh, go back a little bit further to Napoleon. And then Adolf Hitler was probably the most recent historical figure that was working at taking all of Europe and it looked like he was, had expansion on that, too, as far as taking Germany. And uh, he would have been across to America as well. Uh, that was an attempt for another world government, although it says that it wouldn't happen. The, uh, the one that happened here, the, in, in the historical application of this prophecy, you see what happened was in the early 1800s, and this is, we're suffering from this hangover that we got a couple hundred years ago, is that there were, seven, uh, there were ten uh, divisions, ten kings in the division, and, uh, you know, you can look at different uh, prophetic interpretations the Adventist Church has an interpretation where it names all of these. But it also says, in order to make room for the papal power to come on stream, three of the kings were uprooted. And in fact, they, they go as far to say that they became extinct. Okay, so, so that means there was only seven, right? Okay. So it says in the days of these kings. So that would be 10 minus 3 is 7 left over, plus a little horn, which would be uh, 
believed to be the papacy. But the problem is, turn in Revelation chapter 17, it says, in verse, in verse chapter 17, verse 10, or 12, it says, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, referring to these kings now. It says, the ten kings Sorry. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. You see a problem there? So apparently, we have a beast power at the end of time that's made up of ten kings. The historical application, this just does not work. Because we only have seven at the end, because the three were uprooted by the little horn, and they are even named in the prophetic interpretation of Seventh-day Adventism. And other churches probably uh, go along with these concepts. But this is where this part, this last part of the statue, is where churches deviate, because there's no good interpretation of this one. Now. I would suggest that if this was an attempt for a one world system, and we know this when we go back a little bit earlier before this, we see there was an attempt at the Tower of Babel for a one world system. Same thing. That was a, an attempt for evil to rule the world. Here we go. We see this attempt all the way through until we get to the end. Well, you see, the problem was is the people that that saw these prophecies didn't realize that this could not be a fulfillment because they had to prove to everyone that Yeshua was coming quickly, very soon, 19, or 1844, in fact. And so they had to prove without a question that these prophecies had been fulfilled literally as they were written. However, when you're trying to prove something that isn't true, but you're trying to make it true, what do you have to do? You have to massage it enough to get people to believe it. And that's exactly what they did. If we go back to the word, we can see very clearly that this power here, we go on to in verse 14 of chapter 17 of Revelation, it says, these 10 kings, that's what it's talking about now, the context is the 10 kings, these ten kings will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. When we read the word, the beast that it's talking about, when we go over to Revelation 19 to get a little more information on the beast in Revelation 19, it says... In verse 17 of chapter 19, now we're talking about the second coming. We're talking about exactly this prophecy when the God of heaven would come, when Yeshua would return. That's what this prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 is referring to. Revelation 19, we have that event. So in, in verse 17 of chapter 19, it says, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds of the, that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings. Doesn't say ten here, but we're getting there. You shall eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horsemen and those that sit on them, the flesh of all the people, slave and free, both small and great, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth. Now, what I've done here, because the context really demands this, the beast is made up of the kings of the earth. So I put in parentheses here, right after the beast, I put in parentheses the kings of the earth, because the kings of the earth make up the beast. 
We just read that in chapter 17. The, the ten horns get authority with the beast. The beast is the final authority. It's made up of these ten kings uh, that make up this. So the beast is alive and the ten kings are alive. The prophecy in Revelation demands that these ten kings are alive at the time of the end. Here's the, the interesting part. These were all attempts at what? A one world system. They have failed. Napoleon failed. Kaiser Wilhelm has failed. Uh, um, Hitler, Adolf Hitler failed. The last attempt for a one world system is at the time of the end. But the problem is, as we have just seen, is this doesn't work. We have to have 10 kings that make up the beast in the time of the end. That's what prophecy says. That's why we have to go back to the book to see if those that taught us these prophecies were actually reading them correctly. They got all of this right, but this is lacking. Okay, so... That's the obvious thing that has to be wrong right now in Daniel chapter 2. So somebody give us a synopsis of Daniel chapter 7. We looked at this last week. Come on, you students of prophecy. It starts with a lion. I'll help you. Flying with the eagle's wings. Okay, good. That were plucked. Lion with an eagle's wings. Okay, and what else? And then the bear. All right. And then a leopard. And what do we got? And then the dreadful beast that had ten horns. Ten horns. And then the little horn came up and three of the horns were thrown off. Okay. And the little horn... Spoke great Little horn came out of this one, right? Yes, sir. All right, good. So that's that's the second prophecy in Daniel chapter seven. Does anyone recognize why I put them in the places I put them in? That's the order in scripture. But I put them underneath the head of gold, shoulders of silver, thighs, third one, and the iron being the fourth one. Is not that the obvious meaning in this? That the lion with the eagle's wings would be uh, Babylon, the bear would be Medo-Persia, the leopard would be uh, tied in with the thighs. So that would be the Greece. And this would be Rome. And this power would come out of the Roman power. Is that the obvious conclusion? Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's the obvious conclusion. But we need to have a little bit of a closer look at this. So let's do that, shall we? Let's go, and who would like to read a few verses in Daniel chapter 7? Start reading. You may as well start reading at, at chapter 7, uh, verse 1. In first, um, oh, verse 1, okay, yes, sir. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, 
Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the son of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens drove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a, a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and its dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and it stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Keep going. I beheld, the, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Okay. And verse 13 is when the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. So, okay, I'm gonna, just going to try and summarize this a little bit. We've got, we've got the, all the beasts represented here. What they have done, what those that have gone before us have done, is here again they had to demonstrate that all these prophecies had been fulfilled and we were just waiting for Yeshua to come. So in order to, in order to convince people of the time that they were living, time just prior to Yeshua's coming, they had to take the prophecies and they had to demonstrate that they had been fulfilled. And lo and behold, I find myself doing exactly the same thing as they have done. But what I have found is when I examine what they had found and and what they believed they had discovered in the fulfillment of the prophecies, what I have found is they applied the prophecies prematurely, but the ultimate fulfillment was still yet in the future. Now, this, this was a problem, not really for them, but it's a problem for us. And why is it a problem for us? Is because a lot of us have believed what we were told about these prophecies, and we have a hard time changing our position on them. However, in order for us, and it's like the comment that came earlier that, Drew, you were talking about, is we're not sure of the timing. And a lot of people, a lot of people that I know, all they're looking for is Sunday laws. And that's going to be the indicator that time is running out. But however, if we understand the prophecies of what's coming, then we can know what, what the time frame that we have. And that's why God gave the prophecies so the last generation will know the time frame of them. 
So, so that's why we're looking at this again, so that we can go into this time with a little bit of knowledge and assurance that we don't have, while we don't have time to waste, we have still a little bit of time. And isn't that the, the grace of God and the love of God that is given the understanding of these prophecies just when we needed them most? And, and really, that's, that's the big thing. So let's take this apart, shall we, so that we can see what it's actually, uh, what it's actually pointing to. Now, because there are four here, it was, it was easy for those that had gone before us just to lay them right on top of this. Seemed to make sense. Uh, we even get down to the ten horns, and it seems like it's the toes. It seems like the whole thing just lays out again according to what we have here. However, in this prophecy, it gives a little explanation on this that three of these are uprooted as we were indicating here leaving seven left over now when we go to revelation we can see that there has to be 10 at the end so there's something wrong with the historical application when it comes to the end could it be that the kingdom that they were trying to say, the European kingdom that broke into ten, three were uprooted and they named those, I, f I forget who they were, the Visigoths, the Vandals, and the, the Ostrogoths, was it? Yeah. Anyways, these kingdoms were uprooted and it said they, they were made extinct and then it made room for the papacy to gain power. However, that does not work with the book of Revelation and let's go back here. It says what we just read was after all these kingdoms, we get to the little horn. And then it says in Daniel chapter 7 that the little horn is burned with fire. It doesn't tell us how that happens. When we get over to Revelation, the sister book, it tells us exactly how that happens. In talking of the ten horns or the ten kings, in verse 16 of chapter 17 of Revelation, it says, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, that would be the little horn, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. How many horns? How many horns destroy the little horn? 10. How is it that we actually, in the historical application of this prophecy, naming those 10 divisions of ancient Europe after the little horn came on stream, it, it ended up with only seven. But Revelation demands that it's 10 kings that actually destroy the harlot. Now, when we look back into the historical application, it was only one king in 1798 that sent, I understand what I was told, sent a general and took the pope captive. One general from one kingdom, which was France, Napoleon, and put the pope in jail. And I understood he died a year or two later. And this was the destruction of the little horn. This is not even close to what the prophecy demands. And so we've got to look at a, another possibility here. So we can see clearly that this, this historical application as far as anciently could not be fulfilled. But those that have gone before us, because they believed that Yeshua was returning at a certain time, had to force these prophecies. And I, I liken it to a, um, a puzzle. You know, if a if piece doesn't, fit. How many of you have pushed a piece of the puzzle into a certain place and the actual, you know, the, the part that comes off the puzzle actually breaks? And, and this is what they did was they started to force the pieces into the puzzle to make it work. However, when we go back, and this is what we need to do, we need to go back to the puzzle and have a look and see if there are any pieces 
that have segments of the piece broken off so that it will fit. And this is one of those times that it just doesn't fit. When we start to compare it with the greater puzzle, and that's how we build a puzzle, we look at the bigger picture, and we can see we're looking for colors and looking for things that go together. When we look at the book of Revelation, and we start to tie it into the book of Daniel, there are pieces in the book of Revelation that we need in order to see the picture clearly. And I propose this is one of the obvious places. The second obvious place when we start looking at, at, uh, at the book of Daniel in chapter 7, we can see the head of gold and the successive kingdoms. It actually says that. That's the phraseology. But when we look at Daniel 7, just turn back to Daniel 7 again, there is zero indication, and I say that with emphasis, there is zero indication that the bear defeats the lion and the leopard defeats the bear and the fourth beast takes over from the leopard. It's just not there. We've read that into it because we try and force it into this pattern that we have up top. And somebody might say, well, it's obvious that it, it fits in here. Well, it's not so obvious. If we look at other prophets and see how they wrote, we can see that this is not the way the prophets wrote. They would write about a bit of history here, and then another time they'd write about some more history or some future events that were going to happen in prophetic uh, understandings, and then they would look at another time period and see another prophetic understanding. And an example I would like to use in, ch in Isaiah chapter 9, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 9. You can do this. Check, check it out. It talks about uh, in Galilee would arise a great light. And it goes on to talk about what that is. It talks about um, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, and so on. Speaking of the Messiah that would come. So that's a bit of prophecy of a certain point. That was the first coming. So the, that was talking about the first coming of the Messiah. You move down the road a little bit in the book of uh, Isaiah, chapter 24. That's talking about the second coming of the Messiah. The events leading up to that in Isaiah, chapter 24, and Revelation, chapter 19, are almost identical chapters referring to the same event, the, coming, the second coming of the Messiah. We also see in Revelation, where God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes, and we can see that that's not the second coming. That's at the end of the millennium. Now, when we compare that with, with sister prophecies in the book of Jeremiah or the book of Isaiah, we can see chapter 65 in the book of Isaiah, and there are other chapters that are also referring to after the millennium. So we can see here that prophets saw different time periods. And they wrote about these different time periods. I propose that Daniel has the same structure. This was taking it from Nebuchadnezzar, taking all the pushes for the one world order, all down to the time of when the Messiah would come the second time. Now, the lion with the eagle and the bear, I'm proposing that that is not overlaying here but that is taking this part, let me use a different color here. That is a magnification, if you will, from this section. So what I'm saying here is that this, about the ten kings and the feet, is actually Daniel chapter 7 from the lion with the eagle and the bear, the leopard, these are the kings that would be represented in these ten kings here. Now, that's what we want to seriously consider as we start to move forward. Does this work? Well, let's do the math and see how this works. If this is one kingdom, this is a, a second kingdom, and this is another kingdom, 
And we know already that this kingdom ends up with seven. Do we have ten kingdoms that could form an alliance with the little horn ruling the whole thing at the time of the end? Absolutely. The numbers actually add up. So if the numbers add up, we've got to take a serious look at it. Now, the other interesting part is if we look at the world structure today, we can see that there are five permanent members on the UN. And somebody say, well, what do politics have to do with it? I propose that because the Bible mentions kings, it's talking about politics. So people that try and separate politics from prophecy and what God is trying to tell us are never going to get to the bottom of this stuff because it has everything to do with politics. And so when we look at the politics in the time of the end, does it add up? Well, let's look at that. We have five permanent members on the UN Council. The UN was structured to bring in what? World peace. Lasting world peace. So the world is attempting to make some kind of utopia here on this planet, and we know that that's going to fail. But the reality is they're going to attempt it. So at the end of time, after Medo-Persia, uh, Medo-Persia here after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the Ten Kings. The last attempt, I believe this is the, talking about the last attempt in the Ten Kings at the time of the end, made up of this. So what God is showing us in Daniel chapter 7 is now we're zeroing in on this. Why is it important that God is zeroing in on this? Because that's the time of the judgment. And that's the most important time of earth's history. We need to know at what time the judgment is going to happen. And it's contained in Daniel chapter 7. So this whole thing is set in Daniel chapter 7. God is, is showing us. He's zeroing in, putting a magnifying glass on this kingdom. Because we have arrived at the time of the end just prior to when Yeshua is coming back. And as we saw here in Daniel chapter 7, there is no indication that these empires, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and the dreadful beast, are successive kingdoms that overtake one another and they make room for the next one, as in this. To, to make that point better and more secure, I believe, is when we get down to the fourth beast, it talks about the fourth beast has ten horns. Three are uprooted, as we're looking at here, uh, leaving it with seven. So there again, it cannot be a fulfillment, because there's only seven at the end. And But when we add the ones that have gone before us, we do end up with ten. And then the little horn leads the way on that. So once the little horn comes to fruition, we can see here that judgment happens. So as we looked at last week, we see the little horn speaking in Daniel chapter 8. Then we see a judgment scene. Then we see the little horn speaking in Daniel chapter 7 verse 11. So what we can deduce from that is that ju judgment happens during the time that the little horn is speaking. We covered that last week. Uh, for any of you watching on the internet, I would recommend that you go back to that one last week. And uh, we really uh, worked on that point. So we're not going to spend any time on that right now, other than the fact that the judgment happens during the time that the little horn is speaking. Not after, not 50 years after. So those that want to say that this is all talking about 1798, when the little horn was taken captive uh, by Napoleon, and that's the finishing up of the little horn. The judgment has to happen within the time frame of the little horn's activity, which would be prior to 1798, if we're talking historical applications. And of course, we're trying to demonstrate here that it just doesn't work. It was a great attempt um, at these prophecies for those people at that time. But 2020 hindsight, when we go back to the book, and start looking at it, we can see that this just doesn't quite work. Well, the rest of the story helps us a little bit more. So during the time that the little horn is speaking, judgment happens, 
and then judgment is carried out. Judgment follows um, along the way when the little horn is speaking. In other words, God has had enough of what the little horn is doing. And we get into the interpretation, and it says that the little horn was making war against the saints and overcoming them until judgment was made in favor of the saints. So the judgment interrupts the timeline of the little horn. We see that here in verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, the body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And as we saw in Revelation um, 17, that it's the ten horns that execute judgment. So that would be the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the seven that are remaining of the, the fourth beast there, that they actually realize what the little horn is doing, and they execute judgment because it says God has put it in their hearts because judgment was meted out um, in the courts of heaven, and the ten horns executed the judgment on the little horn, and it tells us in Revelation how that happens, how the burning with fire happens here because she's destroyed by those she was ruling over. Then it says in verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their take, dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Here it is. Here's the bottom line. This says... In my reading of this, that at the time that the little horn is destroyed and given to the burning flame, the rest of the beasts are all alive. They're all contemporaries of one another. That's what it says. But at the point when they destroy the little horn, their dominions are taken away, yet their lives were prolonged. So at the time of the destruction of the little horn, which we see in Revelation uh, 17 by the 10 kings. That's all these kings. They have their kingdoms up until the little horn is destroyed, but at that point they lose their dominion. Yet they're still around and alive. That tells me that in the time of the end, these kingdoms are all contemporaries. They're all on the scene at the same time. This is not the way this first one is played out. It just isn't. So when we go back to look at these prophecies, we can see the inconsistency. And I don't do this to badmouth or say, you know, um, make fun of people that got it wrong or say they're evil. They did what they could the way they felt these prophecies were saying back then. But here in the time of the end, we've got to get this right. And it's going to help us as we move forward. Information helps us to make good decisions. If I know how these things are going to be played out at the end, I can start to see the details on the timeline that's being meted out here in these prophecies. And I can know and understand how much time, or at least a good idea about how much time I have before everything breaks loose. That's the point of the prophecies. It's a roadmap, if you will, for the time of the end. So I, what I'm saying here, what I'm summing up here, is now we can take all of this prophecy and fit it into this timeline at the end. We have 10 kings at the time of the end. We saw this in Revelation. So this last ditch effort as a one world order is going to be made up of 10 kings. And as I, as I was saying, when we look at the political arena in the world right now, we happen to have five uh, permanent members of the UN. These are the guys that basically make all the main decisions in the world. But ultimately, these main powers, these five main powers, the permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, were victors in the Second World War. And they set up a structure that they would rule. They would never be replaced. Some of the other kingdoms come and go. They interchange on the uh, UN Security Council. But there are five permanent members. So a lion, we have, uh, I'm just going to put GB, Great Britain. Eagle would be US. Uh, bear would be Russia. 
A leopard would be China. And the last one gets a little interesting because we're not there yet. We have to do a teeny tiny bit of speculating. But the last UN Security Council permanent member is France. But we're told here that this kingdom is made up of 10 kingdoms. I'm going to suggest that France is part of a larger uh, consortium or, or nation block, if you will, uh, the European Union. And, and so France would represent either represent the European Union or the European Union will be uh, structured and they will take the place of France or however that wants to work. But they would represent uh, that last block that's made up of several kings. The only reasonable conclusion, it's the only other kingdom that has many other kings uh, that make it up. And just as the UN is made up of many kingdoms, there are primarily five of those kingdoms that make most of the decisions, and they're called the permanent members on the UN Security Council. So just as the UN uh, with the security members, how there's many kings that make up the UN, there's, there's basically five that run the show. I believe the EU will be structured just like that. There are some weak kings, some strong kings, kingdoms, and uh, it will be structured so that there are 10 uh, main kings and then seven will be uprooted. Very interesting how that's going to happen. That's all a little bit of speculation, but it's not too far off. And I think we can see that developing as we, as we watch and see what's going on. So why has God done it this way? For the simple reason that he wants us to know when judgment is going to happen. He's given us the details on when judgment is going to happen on the prophecies. That's how we know. I can't look up into the sky and see what's going on in the heavens to where God's throne is and see what the judgment, when the judgment starts. But in the prophecies, the judgment is couched within earthly events. And so when these earthly events are taking place, I can know that the judgment in heaven is going to take place. And then I get into the different time periods, as we saw in this prophecy in the interpretation, that the little horn has a time times and a half a time, which is a three and a half year period. So I know that once when the little horn gets power, he's only got so much time until he's destroyed. And we see that at the end in verse um, 25 in Daniel chapter 7, that he has a time, times, and a half. And it says here that in verse 25, he shall speak pompous words, referring to, to uh, verse 8 of the same chapter. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints, the Most High shall intend to change times and laws, giving us what he's going to do. And we know what that means. For a time, times, and a half a time, but the court shall be seated. They shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. So at the end of the time, times, and a half, his dominion is consumed and destroyed forever. We can't miss that point. That is what it says. So at the end of the time, times, and a half, the three and a half years, the Bible says, that it's destroyed forever, or some translations, until the end, uh, or basically, that's it. That's all he gets. So when we're looking at the historical application of this prophecy, ending in 1798, there is no room for any kind of re a resurrection of this little horn for a, a little bit of time at the time of the end. That's not the way the prophecy uh, reads. So that interpretation is what I would call a private interpretation on this. It is not what the prophecy says. He gets a time, times, and a half, and that's it. To turn this into, uh, turn the time, times, and a half into three and a half years, and then take the three and a half years and apply, uh, apply the day for a year prophecy, we're not going to look at that today, but that'll be uh, for another day. 
when we go back into the evidence of why the day for a year principle has been applied, we can see clearly that the texts in Numbers and Ezekiel do, don't have anything to do with prophecy. They were actually judgments because of Israel's disobedience. They were going to be in the, um, because they spied out the land for 40 days, God said they would be in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. It didn't have anything to do with symbolic prophecy or any of that. Uh, had to do with judgment, and we see the same thing in Ezekiel, identical. Nowhere in Scripture does it indicate that when you have prophecy that you have to apply a day for a year. That, uh, that again, is a construct. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a principle, a biblical principle, but uh, we just don't see it in the Bible. And people will claim that uh, Daniel chapter 9 uh, we've got another presentation on that. Daniel chapter 9 does not actually prove the day for a year principle. It lacks in that as well. It doesn't say weeks in the original translation. It says 77s, which are sabbatical years. And the Book of Jubilees uh, substantiates that way that they looked at the timing. 77s um, are... are are 70 blocks of seven years, sabbatical years, and that's what Daniel chapter 9 is talking about as well. So here we see uh, this prophecy has to shrink down into the time of the end, and that's what we're looking at. So with that, we are, we are getting to the end of our uh, time frame. I'd like to open it up right now for um, any questions, comments, if you have any challenges, uh, that's all fair game. I'm not looking for people to agree with what I'm saying. Um, I'm looking for feedback of any kind. And for you that are watching on the internet, uh, that will watch this presentation later, if you have any feedback, we want to hear it because we're all working together to arrive at all truth. And we do appreciate all the feedback that we get, whether it's positive or negative. It's all fair. Okay, so anyone here have any, any comments or feedback, any questions, anything clarified that we need to make? Tom, can yes. I ask a question? Yes. Um, I'm just in, I'm interested in, in it may not you may not have really given it a lot of thought uh, but about if you think that at all because I do think that politics in the UN and all these uh, groupings of countries will play a part in what's coming um, I find it interesting that BRICS is now comprised of at starting January 1st of 10 countries it's expanded from the original five to 10. Um, and when we've talked about Islam, uh, several of the newer countries uh, are predominantly Islamic countries. I just didn't know if you felt like that factored in in any way or might in the future somehow factor in. Yes, that's, that's a really good observation. I have not considered the BRICS nations as, as part of this. Um, however, some of the BRICS nations, obviously, uh, Russia and China, are, are mentioned here. Uh, they would have to change the whole structure of the UN. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't do that. Um, we know that the United States, as we... Saw here the eagle will be plucked off. Uh, this will send shockwaves through the, the United Nations, no question about that. Will the BRICS um, replace the, the UN? I, I really uh, haven't considered that, and maybe I need to consider that. My first. Well, I wonder if it would have something to do with, like, the not, not so much replace the UN, but simply with the new world order and then going to the one world currency. Okay, um, okay. So that's, that's a good point. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. There's a point here that 
that we didn't make, which um, now that you bring that up, it's a good point. Um, in verse 6 of Daniel chapter 7, it says, After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So, I'm proposing that this would be China, this fourth one, and it says dominion is given to it. We can see that even within the BRICS is China. If the United States goes down, China would be really the top dog on the, on the dog pile at this point. And, and we can see this will actually happen. We see that the eagle's wings is going to be plucked off. Um, and so the United States is going to go down. So we are going to see some replacement here. And it, the prophecy tells us that China will have uh, the number one position in the world when this happens. And, of course, they're maneuvering into that position right now. We can see that. And so BRICS, if we look at what the purpose of BRICS is from, from the homework that I've done with it, which is, I wouldn't say, ex uh, you know, totally extensive, but what I have seen is the effort with BRICS is to really, in a sense, take down the United States. So this is all part of, part of taking down the United States and replacing the, the U.S. dollar as the world uh, reserve currency. So in that sense, is BRICS going to have anything to do with it? Absolutely, BRICS will have something to do with it. We're moving towards war, which we haven't covered this. That's, we're going to talk about that next week with Daniel chapter 8. Um, and uh, here we see a, a glimpse. Uh, the eagle's wings are broken off. It's not until we get to Daniel chapter 8 is we see the details on how the eagle's wings are plucked off. Uh, we're moving towards war, which the United States will be broken as a result of that war. So, so all of this, and we're seeing the Arab nations, as you were saying, the Islamic nations, coming together really with China and Russia as the major players here to take down the West. Uh, they're using anyone and everyone they can to fulfill its purpose to break the wings off the eagle and take the United States down. Now, that doesn't mean that we have a perfect alliance when it comes to Islam and China and Russia because they have their pro own problems with, with, uh, with the Islamic powers of the world. And basically, Islam, if you're not Islamic, you are um, an infidel, and they are going to bring judgment on all the infidels. And that would include China and Russia. And that's where we're moving towards um, in that sense. So, yeah, that's something to, to consider for sure, because that is a huge political movement that is afoot at this time. Oh, the, the question here is when the little horn is taken out, by the Ten Kings at the end of time. That isn't the end of time. A lot of people think that, that when the little horn comes back on stream, has a rebirth, if you will, and comes back on stream and starts persecuting God's people again, when the little horn is destroyed, does that mean it's the second coming? No, that does not mean it's the second coming because there's a time times and a half, which is a three and a half year period. We also see two more time periods that follow after that. Uh, 1290 and a 1335 day period. So there is a, a lapse uh, in time for the little horn, but that will be the time period um, when the Antichrist will reign. The actual Antichrist will reign, which I believe to be Satan himself impersonating the second coming and coming back to set up his kingdom here on earth. It's a perfect deception, and, and I was talking to somebody this week, if we will actually read the book of Revelation and see the events portrayed in the book of Revelation and the absolute destruction, and not only of life, but of the environment, and it says in chapter 14 that God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth, 
you know, this earth is going to be reduced to its uh, pre-Edenic state when it was without form and void. And basically human beings are going to bring it to that point. And God says he's going to destroy those human beings. In chapter 14, it tells us that, who destroyed the earth. So the earth is going to be brought to total chaos. Not just chaos within society, but chaos all around us. And it will be at this point when Yeshua will return. But prior to Yeshua's returning is the world will come to the conclusion that the only way we're getting out of this is for the Messiah to return. So what better, what better deception could happen than for the whole world to expect the Messiah is going to return and set up his kingdom on the earth at that time? And that's when Satan will arrive prior to Yeshua's return. And that's why we need to understand the festival calendar and the typology behind the festival calendar because it reveals when Yeshua is going to come back. And I'm not saying the actual year of his return, but it does indicate the festival upon which the true Messiah will return. It also points out the festival, once we start to connect it with the prophecies, we can see which festival the counterfeit um, Messiah will return. And um, spoil, what do they call that? Spoiler? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. The, the counterfeit uh, festival that the Messiah will, the false Messiah will come will be on the, the date that Christians are looking for him, that Jews are looking for him, that Messianics are looking for him. It should be a red flag that everyone's looking for a specific calendar event on God's calendar that the Messiah will return. That's a counterfeit. When everyone's looking over here, when everyone should be looking over here. And the, the road to here is wide, but the road to there is narrow. So the calendar needs to be understood uh, for what it is and for the events that it's portraying. And I'd say the best clue of all is when in the calendar of events is the focus on resurrection. That to me is key when we start to understand the calendar is what, where in typology do we have resurrection? And of course, that's what we're looking at when the Messiah comes back. It's resurrection time. So, um, yeah, so is that the end of religion? That's what you asked when the little horn is destroyed. No, actually, that will be the beginning of real, hardcore, uh, counterfeit religion because Satan's going to be showing up near the end of uh, the little horn. Yeah, good, good point. Okay, well, let's, let's have a word of prayer. And, uh, okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that is sure. And Father, help us to be serious students of prophecy so that we can know what's coming and we can be prepared for what's coming. Not just physically, though, as we've talked about today. We need to be spiritually prepared for judgment because this is the time that we're moving into is the time when the prophecies indicate that judgment will begin. And we know that it begins uh, with the house of God first. And that's who we claim to be of your house. We ask, Father, that you give us understanding of these things. We claim the promise of Yeshua that you would reveal all truth and things to come. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.